Section 54 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Clip. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 3, Section 54, Excerpts from History of the United States, Part 1, by George Bancroft. The Beginnings of Virginia, from History of the United States. The period of success in planting Virginia had arrived, yet not till changes in European politics and society had molded the forms of colonization. The Reformation had broken the harmony of religious opinion, and differences in the Church began to constitute the basis of political parties. After the East Indies had been reached by doubling the southern promontory of Africa, the great commerce of the world was carried upon the ocean. The art of printing had been perfected and diffused, and the press spread intelligence and multiplied the facilities of instruction. The feudal institutions, which had been reared in the Middle Ages, were already undermined by the current of time and events, and swaying from their base threatened to fall. Productive industry had built up the fortunes and extended the influence of the active classes, while habits of indolence and expense had impaired the estates and diminished the power of the nobility. These changes produced corresponding results in the institutions which were to rise in America. A revolution had equally occurred in the purposes for which voyages were undertaken. The hope of Columbus, as he sailed to the west, had been the discovery of a new passage to the East Indies. The passion for gold next became the prevailing motive. Then the islands and countries near the equator were made the tropical gardens of the Europeans. At last, the higher design was matured, to plant permanent Christian colonies, to establish for the oppressed and the enterprising places of refuge and abode, to found states in a temperate clime, with all the elements of independent existence. In the imperfect condition of industry, a redundant population had existed in England even before the peace with Spain, which threw out of employment the gallant men who had served under Elizabeth by sea and land, and left them no option but to engage as mercenaries in the quarrels of strangers, or incur the hazards of seeking the new world. The minds of many persons of intelligence and rank were directed to Virginia. The brave and ingenious Gosnold, who had himself witnessed the fertility of the western soil, long solicited the concurrence of his friends for the establishment of a colony, and at last prevailed with Edward Maria Wingfield, a merchant of the west of England, Robert Hunt, a clergyman of fortitude and modest worth, and John Smith, an adventurer of rarest qualities, to risk their lives and hopes of fortune in an expedition. For more than a year this little company revolved the project of a plantation, at the same time, Sir Ferdinando Gorges was gathering information of the Native Americans whom he had received from Weymouth, and whose descriptions of the country, joined to the favorable views which he had already imbibed, filled him with the strongest desire of becoming a proprietary of domains beyond the Atlantic. Gorges was a man of wealth, rank, and influence. He readily persuaded Sir John Popham, Lord Chief Justice of England, to share his intentions. Nor had the assigns of Raleigh become indifferent to western planting, which the most distinguished of them all, industrious Hucklet, the historian of maritime enterprise, still promoted by his personal exertions, his weight of character, and his invincible zeal. Possessed of whatever information could be derived from foreign sources, and a correspondence with eminent navigators of his times, and anxiously watching the progress of Englishmen in the West, his extensive knowledge made him a counsellor in every colonial enterprise. The King of England, too timid to be active, yet too vain to be indifferent, favoured the design of enlarging his dominions. He had attempted in Scotland the introduction of the arts of life among the Highlanders in the Western Isles by the establishment of colonies, and the Scottish plantations which he founded in the northern counties of Ireland contributed to the affluence and the security of that island. When, therefore, a company of men of business and men of rank, formed by the experience of Gosnold, the enthusiasm of Smith, the perseverance of Hacklut, and the influence of Papa Mangorgis, applied to James I for leave to deduce a colony into Virginia, the monarch, on the 10th of April, 1606, readily set his seal to an ample patent. The first colonial charter, under which the English were planted in America, deserves careful consideration. 
D. Appleton and Company, New York. Men and Government in Early Massachusetts, from History of the United States. These better auspices and the invitations of Winthrop won new emigrants from Europe. During the long summer voyage of the two hundred passengers who freighted the Griffin, three sermons a day beguiled their weariness. Among them was Haynes, a man of very large estate and larger affections, of a heavenly mind and a spotless life, of rare sagacity and accurate but unassuming judgment, by nature tolerant, ever a friend to freedom, ever conciliating peace, an able legislator, dear to the people by his benevolent virtues and his disinterested conduct. Then also came the most revered spiritual teachers of two commonwealths, the acute and subtle Cotton, the son of a Puritan lawyer, eminent in Cambridge as a scholar, quick in the nice perception of distinctions, and pliant in dialects, in manner persuasive rather than commanding, skilled in the fathers and the schoolmen, but finding all their wisdom compactly stored in Calvin, deeply devout by nature as well as habit from childhood, hating heresy, and still precipitately eager to prevent evil actions by suppressing ill opinions, yet verging toward a progress in truth and in religious freedom, an avowed enemy to democracy, which he feared as the blind despotism of animal instincts in the multitude, yet opposing hereditary power in all its forms, desiring a government of moral opinion, according to the laws of universal equity, and claiming the ultimate resolution for the whole body of the people. And Hooker, of vast endowments, a strong will, and an energetic mind, ingenious in his temper, and open in his professions, trained to benevolence by the discipline of affliction, versed in tolerance by his refuge in Holland, choleric, yet gentle in his affections, firm in his faith, yet readily yielding to the power of reason, the peer of the reformers without their harshness, the devoted apostle to the humble and the poor, severe toward the proud, mild in his soothings of a wounded spirit, glowing with the raptures of devotion, and kindling with the messages of redeeming love. His eye, voice, gesture, and whole frame animate with the living vigor of heartfelt religion, public-spirited and lavishly charitable, and though persecutions and banishments had awaited him as one wave follows another, ever serenely blessed with a glorious peace of soul, fixed in his trust in providence, and in his adhesion to that cause of advancing civilization, which he cherished always, even while it remained to him a mystery. This was he whom, for his abilities and services, his contemporaries placed in the first rank of men, praising him as the one rich pearl with which Europe more than repaid America for the treasures from her coast. The people to whom Hooker ministered had preceded him. As he landed, they crowded about him with their welcome. Now I live, exclaimed he, as with open arms he embraced them. Now I live, if ye stand fast in the Lord. Thus recruited, the little band in Massachusetts grew more jealous of its liberties. The prophets in exile see the true forms of the house. By a common impulse, the freemen of the towns chose deputies to consider in advance the duties of the general court. The charter plainly gave legislative power to the whole body of the freemen. If it allowed representatives, thought Winthrop, it was only by inference, and as the whole people could not always assemble, the chief power, it was argued, lay necessarily with the assistants. Far different was the reasoning of the people. To check the democratic tendency, Cotton, on the election day, preached to the assembled freemen against rotation in office. The right of an honest magistrate to his place was like that of a proprietor to his freehold. But the electors, now between three and four hundred in number, were bent on exercising their absolute power, and reversing the decision of the pulpit, chose a new governor and deputy. The mode of taking the votes was at the same time reformed, and instead of the erection of hands, the ballot box was introduced. Thus, the people established a reformation of such things as they judged to be amiss in the government. It was further decreed that the whole body of the freemen should be convened only for the election of the magistrates. To these, with deputies to be chosen by the several towns, the powers of legislation and appointment were henceforward entrusted. The trading corporation was unconsciously become a representative democracy. 
The law against arbitrary taxation followed. None but the immediate representatives of the people might dispose of lands or raise money. Thus early did Massachusetts echo the voice of Virginia, like deep calling unto deep. The state was filled with the hum of village politicians. The freemen of every town in the bay were busy in inquiring into their liberties and privileges. With the exception of the principle of universal suffrage, now so happily established, the representative democracy was as perfect two centuries ago as it is today. Even the magistrates, who acted as judges, held their office by the annual popular choice. Elections cannot be safe there long, said the lawyer Letchford. The same prediction has been made these two hundred years. The public mind, ever in perpetual agitation, is still easily shaken, even by slight and transient impulses. But after all vibrations, it follows the laws of the moral world and safely recovers its balance. D. Appleton and Company, New York King Philip's War From History of the United States Thus was Philip hurried into his rebellion, and he is reported to have wept as he heard that a white man's blood had been shed. He had kept his men about him in arms, and had welcomed every stranger, and yet, against his judgment and his will, he was involved in war. For what prospect had he of success? The English were united, the Eng Indians had no alliance, the English made a common cause, half the Indians were allies of the English, or were quiet spectators of the fight. The English had guns enough, but few of the Indians were well armed, and they could get no new supplies. The English had towns for their shelter and safe retreat. The miserable wigwams of the natives were defenseless. The English had sure supplies of food. The Indians might easily lose their precarious stores. Frenzy prompted their rising. They rose without hope, and they fought without mercy. For them as a nation, there was no tomorrow. The minds of the English were appalled by the horrors of the impending conflict, and superstition indulged in its wild inventions. At the time of the eclipse of the moon, you might have seen the figure of an Indian scalp imprinted on the center of its disk. The perfect form of an Indian bow appeared in the sky. The sighing of the wind was like the whistling of bullets. Some heard invisible troops of horses gallop through the air, while others found the prophecy of calamities in the howling of the wolves. At the very beginning of danger, the colonists exerted their wanted energy. Volunteers from Massachusetts joined the troops from Plymouth, and within a week from the commencement of hostilities, the insulated Poconogets were driven from Mount Hope, and in less than a month Philip was a fugitive among the Nipmucks, the interior tribes of Massachusetts. The little army of the colonists then entered the territory of the Narragansetts, and from the reluctant tribe extorted a treaty of neutrality with a promise to deliver up every hostile Indian. Victory seemed promptly assured, but it was only the commencement of horrors. Kananchet, the chief sachem of the Narragansetts, was the son of Miantonimo, and could he forget his father's wrongs? Desolation extended along the whole frontier. Banished from his patrimony, where the pilgrims found a friend, and from his cabin, which had sheltered the exiles, Philip, with his warriors, spread through the country, awakening their brethren to a warfare of extermination. The war, on the part of the Indians, was one of ambuscades and surprises. They never once met the English in open field, but always, even if eightfold in numbers, fled timorously before infantry. They were as secret as beasts of prey skillful marksmen, and in part provided with firearms, fleet of foot, conversant with all the paths of the forest, patient of fatigue, and mad with a passion for rapine, vengeance, and destruction, retreating into swamps for their fastnesses, or hiding in the greenwood thickets where the leaves muffled the eyes of the pursuer. By the rapidity of their descent, they seemed omnipresent among the scattered villages, which they ravished like a passing storm, and for a full year they kept all New England in a state of terror and excitement. The exploring party was waylaid and cut off, and the mangled carcasses and disjointed limbs of the dead were hung upon the trees. The laborer in the field, the reapers as they sallied forth to the harvest, men as they went to mill, the shepherd's boy among the sheep were shot down by skulking foes whose approach was invisible. Who can tell the heavy hours of women? The mother, if left alone in the house, feared the tomahawk for herself and children. 
On the sudden attack, the husband would fly with one child, the wife with another, and perhaps only one escape. The village cavalcade, making its way to meeting on Sunday in files on horseback, the farmer holding the bridle in one hand and the child in the other, his wife seated on a pillion behind him. It may be a child in her lap, as was the fashion in those days, could not proceed safely, but at the moment when least expected, bullets would whiz around them, sent from an unseen enemy by the wayside. The forest that protected the ambush of the Indians secured their retreat. D. Appleton and Company, New York. The New Netherland, from History of the United States. During the absence of Stuyvesant from Manhattan, the warriors of the neighboring Algonquin tribes, never reposing confidence in the Dutch, made a desperate assault on the colony. In sixty-four canoes they appeared before the town and ravished the adjacent country. The return of the expedition restored confidence. The captives were ransomed, and industry repaired its losses. The Dutch seemed to have firmly established their power and promised themselves happier years. New Netherland consoled them for the loss of Brazil. They exulted in the possession of an admirable territory that needed no embankments against the ocean. They were proud of its vast extent, from New England to Maryland, from the sea to the great river of Canada, and the remote northwestern wilderness. They sounded with exultation the channel of the deep stream, which was no longer shared with the Swedes. They counted with delight its many lovely runs of water, on which the beavers built their villages, and the great travelers who had visited every continent as they ascended the Delaware declared it one of the noblest rivers in the world, with banks more inviting than the lands of the Amazon. Meantime, the country near the Hudson gained by increasing emigration. Manhattan was already the chosen abode of merchants, and the policy of the government invited them by its good will. If Stuyvesant sometimes displayed the rash despotism of a soldier, he was sure to be reproved by his employers. Did he change the rate of duties arbitrarily? The directors, sensitive to commercial honor, charged him to keep every contract inviolate. Did he tamper with the currency by raising the nominal value of foreign coin? The measure was rebuked as dishonest. Did he attempt to fix the price of labor by arbitrary rules? This also was condemned as unwise and impracticable. Did he interfere with the merchants by inspecting their accounts? The deed was censured as without precedent in Christendom, and he was ordered to treat the merchants with kindness, lest they return, and the country be depopulated. Did his zeal for Calvinism lead him to persecute Lutherans? He was chid for his bigotry. Did his hatred of the abominable sect of Quakers imprison and afterwards exile the blameless bound? Let every peaceful citizen, wrote the directors, enjoy freedom of conscience. This maxim has made our city the asylum for fugitives from every land. Tread in its steps, and you shall be blessed. Private worship was therefore allowed to every religion. Opinion, if not yet enfranchised, was already tolerated. The people of Palestine, from the destruction of their temple, an outcast and a wandering race, were allured by the traffic and condition of the New World, and not the Saxon and Celtic races only. The children of the bondmen that broke from slavery in Egypt, the posterity of those who had wandered in Arabia and worshipped near Calvary, found a home, liberty, and a burial place on the island of Manhattan. The emigrants from Holland were themselves of the most various lineage, for Holland had long been the gathering place of the unfortunate. Could we trace the descent of the emigrants from the Low Countries to New Netherland, we should be carried not only to the banks of the Rhine and the borders of the German Sea, but to the Protestants who escaped from France after the massacre of Bartholomew's Eve, and to those earlier inquirers who were swayed by the voice of the Huss in the heart of Bohemia. New York was always a city of the world. Its settlers were relics from the first fruits of the Reformation, chosen from the Belgic provinces in England, from France and Bohemia, from Germany and Switzerland, from Piedmont and the Italian Alps. The religious sects, which in the Middle Ages had been fostered by the municipal liberties of the south of France, were the harbingers of modern freedom, and had therefore been sacrificed to the inexorable feudalism of the north. After a bloody conflict, the plebeian reformers, crushed by the merciless leaders of the military aristocracy, escaped to the highlands that divide France and Italy. Preserving the discipline of a benevolent ascetic mor morality, 
with the simplicity of a spiritual worship. When all our fathers worshipped stocks and stones, it was found, on the progress of the Reformation, that they had by three centuries anticipated Luther and Calvin. The hurricane of persecution, which was to have swept Protestantism from the earth, did not spare their seclusion. Mothers with infants were rolled down the rocks, and the bones of martyrs scattered on the Alpine mountains. The city of Amsterdam offered the fugitive Waldenses a free passage to America, and a welcome was prepared in New Netherland for the few who were willing to emigrate. The persecuted of every creed and every clime were invited to the colony. When the Protestant churches of Rochelle were raised, the Calvinists of that city were gladly admitted, and the French Protestants came in such numbers that the public documents were sometimes issued in French as well as in Dutch and English. Troops of orphans were shipped for the milder desti destinies of the New World. A free passage was offered to mechanics, for population was known to be the bulwark of every state. The government of New Netherland was had formed just ideas of the fit materials for building a commonwealth. They desired farmers and laborers, foreigners and exiles, men inured to toil and penury. The colony increased, children swarmed in every village, the advent of the year and the month of May were welcomed with noisy frolics. New modes of activity were devised, lumber was shipped to France, the whale pursued off the coast, the vine, the mulberry, planted, flocks of sheep as well as cattle were multiplied, and tile, so long imported from Holland, began to be manufactured near Fort Orange. New Amsterdam could, in a few years, boast of stately buildings and almost vied with Boston. This happily situated province, said its inhabitants, may become the granary of our fatherland. Should our Netherlands be wasted by grievous wars, it will offer our countrymen a safe retreat. By God's blessing, we shall in a few years become a mighty people." Thus did varied nations of the Caucasian race assist in colonizing our central states. D. Appleton and Company, New York. Franklin, from History of the United States. Franklin looked quietly and deeply into the secrets of nature. His clear understanding was never perverted by passion, nor corrupted by the pride of theory. The son of a rigid Calvinist, the grandson of a tolerant Quaker, he had from boyhood been familiar not only with theological subtleties, but with a Catholic respect for freedom of mind. Skeptical of tradition as the basis of faith, he respected reason rather than authority, and after a momentary lapse into fatalism, he gained with increasing years an increasing trust in the overruling providence of God. Adhering to none of all the religions in the colonies, he yet devoutly, though without form, adhered to religion. But though famous as a disputant, and having a natural aptitude for metaphysics, he obeyed the tendency of his age, and sought by observation to win an insight into the mysteries of being. The best observers praise his method most. He so sincerely loved truth that in his pursuit of her she met him halfway. Without prejudice and without bias, he discerned intuitively the identity of the laws of nature with those of which humanity is conscious so that his mind was like a mirror in which the universe, as it reflected itself, revealed her laws. His morality, repudiating ascetic severities and the system which enjoins them, was indulgent to appetites of which he abhorred the sway, but his affections were of a calm intensity. In all his career the love of man held the mastery over personal interest. He had not the imagination which inspires the bard or kindles the orator, but an exquisite propriety, parsimonious of ornament, gave ease, correctness, and graceful simplicity even to his most careless writings. In life, also, his tastes were delicate. Indifferent to the pleasures of the table, he relished the delights of music and harmony, of which he enlarged the instruments. His blandness of temper, his modesty, the benignity of his manners, made him the favorite of intelligent society. And with healthy cheerfulness... He derived pleasure from books, from philosophy, from conversation, now administering consolation to the sorrower, now indulging in light-hearted gaiety. In his intercourse, the universality of his perceptions bore, perhaps, the character of humor, but while he clearly discerned the contrast between the grandeur of the universe and the feebleness of man, a serene benevolence saved him from the contempt of his race or disgust at its toils. 
To superficial observers he might have seemed as an alien from speculative truth, limiting himself to the world of the senses. And yet, in study, and among men, his mind always sought to discover and apply the general principles by which nature and affairs are controlled, now deducing from the theory of caloric improvements in fireplaces and lanterns, and now advancing human freedom by firm inductions from the inalienable rights of man. Never of professing enthusiasm, never making a parade of sentiment, his practical wisdom was sometimes mistaken for the offspring of selfish prudence, yet his hope was steadfast, like that hope which rests on the rock of ages, and his conduct was an, as unerring as though the light that led him was a light from heaven. He never anticipated action by theories of self-sacrificing virtue, and yet, in the moments of intense activity, he from the abodes of ideal truth brought down and applied to the affairs of life the principles of goodness, as unostentatiously as became the man who with a kite and a hempen string drew lightning from the skies. He separated himself so little from his age that he has been called the representation of materialism, and yet, when he thought on religion, his mind passed beyond reliance on sex to faith in God. When he wrote on politics, he founded freedom on principles that know no change. When he turned an observing eye on nature, he passed from the effect to the cause, from individual appearances to universal laws. When he reflected on history, his philosophic mind found gladness and repose in the clear anticipation of the progress of humanity. End of Volume 3 End of Section 54 Recorded by Paul Clip, Krakow, Poland End of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 3